Hello, everybody. I'm Ermina Van Dyken, MD from Out of the Doldrums. I'm here today with my good friend, Dr. Riz Bakari. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, we're, I'm very excited to be here. It's uh, a lovely venue, and uh, I look, I've been looking forward to get, getting back together with you. Awesome. So we're here at Honolulu Bay on Maui. Um, it's a beautiful place, and most people come to Honolulu Bay just for the snorkeling and the bay itself, but. Uh, there's a forest here right before as you go in and it's just beautiful full of banyan trees and just fun stuff so check it out if you're ever on this side of Maui. Absolutely, I would recommend it. Cool, yeah. very good. good. So we had Riz and your wife Maya um, on the show a while back, I think it was in August? It was the summer, we were here I don't know when, July? Hmm. Yeah, late July. July. Yeah, so we had a good time talking with you um, and Maya, a lot of fun stuff, sailing, that type of thing. Today, I really want to get into medical stuff and plant-based stuff and really talk about some nitty-gritty things. Cool. You Sounds game? good. Yeah. Well, okay. I'll do my best. <laughs> awesome. So you're a vascular surgeon, I understand. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Tell the audience what a vascular surgeon is. Like, what do you do every day? Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's really interesting. And it's a good question because many people don't know. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think I'm a cardiologist. Uh, so I do deal with the blood vessels of the body. Okay. I, I usually describe to people that... Uh, you know, people, most people know what a cardiologist is, and they know what a cardiac surgeon is. Yeah. The cardiologist deals with the medical therapies and minimally invasive therapies of the heart. The cardiac surgeon deals with the open surgical therapies of the heart. And the vascular surgeon does both, the, the medical and minimally invasive therapies and the surgical therapies of all the other blood vessels in the body, except for inside the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, so no heart, no brain, but every other one. So I might treat the carotid arteries or the arteries of the belly, like the aorta and the mesenteric arteries that supply the intestines. Um, and then the arteries to the legs. And, and myself, uh, in, in particular, uh, my specialty is limb salvage. Okay. So uh, the vast majority of work I do is in the legs where I'm trying to prevent people from having, losing their legs and having limitations. Got it. Limb salvage. So these people that have diseases in their peripheral arteries where you're trying to salvage their limbs, are they, do they typically have any medical diagnoses that put them at higher risk, or is it random takers? Yeah. No, no. Uh, atherosclerosis, which is the disease uh, which people know as heart disease, mm -hmm. uh, affects uh, many, many people. Mm -hmm. Probably uh, everybody has atherosclerosis to some extent, sure. uh, it, because it starts uh, when we're very young and slowly grows, mm -hmm. and it becomes symptomatic in a, in a significant number of Americans. Uh, later in their later years, uh, either manifesting itself as heart disease or vascular disease. Okay. So if you were to wonder if you have vascular disease as an adult, what type of symptoms would you expect? So the, the typical stuff, uh, well, the way I describe it is whatever artery is blocked, uh, to that's blocked significantly, whatever's downstream of that artery is where you typically will see symptoms. Got so, it. for example, if you have blockages in the carotid arteries, uh -huh. then the what's downstream of the carotid arteries, it's the brain. So right. you'll have symptoms in the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the most common and typical one I treat is stroke. Sure. Uh, if you have blockages in the intestinal arteries, people will have pain. Mm -hmm. It's typically pain uh, when, when they eat and sure. when they're trying to deliver more blood flow to the intestines because they need to digest the food and then they might uh, hurt. And then uh, in the legs, it, it typically starts as pain when you're walking, pain in the calves. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, once, it, once it progresses, you can have pain at rest. Mm -hmm. And when it progresses even further, you might have wounds and sores that don't heal. And I might comment that that pain in the calves when you walk or the pain in your intestines when you eat is angina. The term angina sure. is uh, uh, similar to the angina people have in their heart. Right. So basically, when the heart needs more blood flow and it can't deliver it due to blockages in the coronary arteries, you get angina. Sure. So pain in the calves or intestinal pain is also angina. Just different names. So this, um, we can't really talk about the vascular surgeon and the vascular field without getting into the endothelium and okay. what it is. Can you give me a little bit of background and just tell our audience what is it and why is it so important? Because I think the misconception is a lot of people feel that blood vessels are just like pipes. Right. They don't do anything. And tell me more yeah. about it. And that, that is an interesting misconception because they'll come to me and they think it's just a pipe that can be yeah, replaced. like a plumber. Yeah, and then they're okay. <laughs> and and that, uh, what the point I try to get across to them is that uh, atherosclerosis is a chronic indolent disease that mm -hmm. affects the entire body. Yes. It doesn't just affect one artery and then I go fix that one artery and the problem is gone. Right. And, uh, and, the, and the reason being is uh, that the arteries, I consider the arteries an organ of the body. Mm -hmm. And they are living, breathing uh, vessels. They're not... As, as you heard me allude to before, they're not plastic tubes or they're not metal pipes. They expand, they contract, 
they have physiologic processes. Things come in and, in and out of them. Uh, and then you mentioned the endothelium. The endothelium is uh, a very thin layer of cells that line the inside of the artery, mm -hmm. and they're uh, important in creating and making various hormones and uh, different items for the blood, uh, and, uh, as well as regulating transport of things inside, in and out of the blood. Sure. Uh, and so uh, we can't think of it as just a, a static mechanism. It's a, it's a very dynamic situation. Definitely. So what we're learning nowadays is we really can manipulate our endothelium, and we can do things for endothelial health, mm -hmm. um, and largely most of them are either exercise or food related. So yes. um, a good example of that, like we have been talking about earlier, leafy greens, right? right. How do leafy greens affect the endothelium? So I must say, I didn't grow up green, eating green, green <laughs> leafy vegetables. I oh, I hated spinach. I didn't like greens, collard greens. You know, I would, you know, I would run away from them. Right, and right. I, but I've had a paradigm shift in my in my own personal life, and mm -hmm. and now they are my favorite food. And because it tastes, or because you know what they well, do for you. Well, yeah, <laughs> okay. you know, and I think that, that that you can find a way to make foods taste good. Yeah. And, uh, but I'll take and and you can find a way to uh, get your favorite fruits and vegetables and things uh, in a manner that's good, uh, meaningful to you. Mm -hmm. But there, uh, I mean, it's, it's both. It, for me, as I'm biased as a vascular surgeon. The green leafy vegetables are uh, extremely important in helping increase our nitric oxide in our body. And to kind of, to kind of take a step back, and, well, what is nitric oxide? You know, we talked about the endothelium, and one of the main things that uh, the endothelium makes is nitric oxide. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's a good molecule in arterial health. It helps uh, dilate blood vessels. It helps uh, promote or yeah, it helps prevent atherosclerosis, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it regulates some other things in the body as well. But from that standpoint, just the prevention of atherosclerosis and dilating blood vessels, reducing blood pressure, you know, fighting hypertension, it yeah. makes an extremely uh, important blood vessel. I mean, uh, uh, it makes it an extremely important Mo uh, molecule, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, as you know, we naturally stop making as much as we age. Uh, by the time we're about 40, there's a natural process where we start to reduce the amount of nitric oxide we make. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to supplement it through our diet. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, in the idea of preventing atherosclerosis, supplementation through our diet uh, is uh, uh, important. And, in it, and it's uh, also important in helping reverse atherosclerosis. Definitely. So when atherosclerosis occurs in a blood vessel, the endothelium gets destroyed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so therefore that, most important, that very important lining which creates all these important things for us, especially the nitric oxide, the nitric oxide is no longer made. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, well, it's kind of a, a downward spiral. The, the nitric oxide which was helping prevent atherosclerosis uh, is no longer made, so the atherosclerosis which is destroying it can kind of keep going unfettered. Right, yeah. go haywire. So uh, taking in green leafy vegetables and increasing your nitric oxide in your body can help uh, mm -hmm. attenuate that process and hopefully even reverse it if you're aggressive. Right. So I think a lot of people don't really know uh, Caldwell Esselstyn's whole strategy with the green leafy vegetables, so five to six cups every day is mm -hmm. his protocol. Mm -hmm. um, the whole principle of that is for nitric oxide generation, and vasodilatation, so getting those blood vessels open. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think a lot of people know that. They're right. Like, oh, why is this guy telling me to eat five to six cups of leafy greens? That's a lot of greens. Right. You know, I and I, I can actually point to in my patients more about their coronary findings sure. than their peripheral findings because I you see results very quickly uh, when mm -hmm. uh, when patients start to uh, take in several servings of green leafy vegetables on a daily basis. Uh, there's uh, there's an immediate effect. We talk about that vasodilatation. Yeah. And so their their uh, their angina. If they've got stable angina, where they might be getting it after five minutes of walking, you see that stable angina begin to regress within a couple of weeks, oh, that's cool. which is absolutely amazing. Right, and uh, encouraging for patients yeah. too, I'm sure. I mean, when they see that chest pain go away, uh -huh. uh, it, it's, a, it's a good feedback mechanism. Oh, look what I'm doing is helping, I'm going to keep doing it. But so right. I really like that part. And so that, that, that angina starts to regress quite quickly. That doesn't mean that the disease is gone. Mm -hmm. But if, uh, if you think about a, a stable amount of disease in an artery that's limiting blood flow, limiting yeah. blood flow mm -hmm. and you're able to stop it right there, and then maybe even just begin to dilate those arteries just a little bit yeah. and allow more blood flow, and you're dilating those arteries because you're taking in all that nitric oxide, right. you may not have reversed the atherosclerosis yet, but the dilatation allows more blood flow, and the angina becomes less. Right. And so so you, if you have a tissue, sorry to interrupt, but mm -hmm. if you have a tissue that's 
like ischemic or borderline and it needs every drop of blood it can get, even opening it up a tiny bit is going to make a huge difference. One percent. You know, huh. just you just got wow. to that. Say you got to that point where you just started having the chest pain. Yeah. And all you need to do is go back a little bit to make that chest pain go away. Exactly. That's what you're seeing. And then, uh, so there's an immediate effect. We also know that from a there, it's a whole dietary thing. We also know that in lots of fats and oils, when you ingest those every few hours it, with fatty meals in the standard American diet, you're causing rigidity of your arteries. Right. So the standard American diet, which is also poor in green leaf and vegetables, is not only making your arteries more rigid, but when you switch to a plant-based diet, which is free of all of those things, and you add the greens, mm -hmm. you're also decreasing that rigidity, which are also allowing vasodilatation, and then you're starting the slow process of regression of that plant. Right. Uh, do you happen to know the mechanism of why the oils contribute to rigidity? Is it just because it inhibits the endothelium? You know, I, I, uh, I don't know that answer exactly. I, I'm just I, and in fact, I'm embarrassed to say that when I read the article, I didn't go any further. Oh. I just got stuck on the whole point that, oh, oh look, oh. <laughs> oils cause, uh, you know, regular oil exposure causes rigidity. Right. And I need to go back and look that up. Well, if we even know. Right, yeah. and that's the thing. But it's also very counterintuitive with pop media these days talking about the Mediterranean diet and olive oil and, you know, it's healthy for you to put a ton of olive oil, not a ton, but olive oil on your salad dressing or whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be if the evidence shows that it contributes to arterial rigidity. Right. That's interesting. Uh, the, I always use this whole thing of compared to what. Yeah. So the Mediterranean yep. diet is healthy. Compared, compared to the, to the standard, standard American, American diet. diet. Right. And so, yes, you're going to be healthier and you're going to do better. And mm -hmm. uh, and so, if I'm trying to meet people where they are, I'm happy that they go to that. Oh, yeah. And then maybe I'll try to help them continue to learn. Just like me, uh, it's been a process. Yeah. And I've continued to evolve and change and learn more and, and refine right. my the way I do things. But then I think then, okay, then what about the, stand, the, the, the Mediterranean diet compared to a really clean plant-based diet? Well, the plant-based diet is even healthier. So, uh, you know, uh, I think that then people will, when they don't know about the plant-based diet or they're comparing just the, the Mediterranean diet to a standard American diet, mm -hmm. yeah, it is healthier. And then they might think then, therefore, because it's healthier, that oil is healthier. Yeah. Uh, and it's healthy to take in that oil and it's healthy to take in that little amount of meat and some of that fish. Right. Uh, and uh, again, I would say, yes, it is compared to the standard American diet. Right. Absolutely. I agree with that. And you could make the same argument for the DASH diet. Mm -hmm. you know, or any of these heart-healthy diets right. that are out there, I definitely agree. So back to the comparing diets, you know, plant-based diet is way better compared to what, or Mediterranean compared to what. What about the keto diet? It's all the rage these days. Do yeah. you know if there's been any comparisons or studies, or is it better than, say, the standard American diet? Uh, you know, that's a, the, way I, the way I try to explain it to my, the people I work with, my patients, mm -hmm. is that anytime you're focusing on your health, and yeah. even the keto diet, you're yep. starting to focus on your health and uh, you, there, you tend to do things that make you healthier. You might start watching what you eat, you might start exercising. And, I, you know, the, the keto diet, it does cause people to lose weight. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but it's not I don't know that it's necessarily a healthy weight to lose weight. Uh, right. And from a cardiovascular standpoint, you're exposing yourself to cholesterol, saturated fats. Uh, these things that I know in the long run are going to cause significant atherosclerosis. So you're talking about short-term gains, uh, but long-term problems. And mm -hmm. we do, we you know, when we've looked at the literature, there's no long-term literature out there on the keto, keto diet. Correct. I, and I would think that, you know, if there was, with as long as this kind of concept has been around, the, the high-fat, low-carb diet, starting with the Atkins diet, the South Beach diet, the Paleo diet, the yeah. keto diet, they're all variations of the same thing, mm -hmm. then if, if someone was able to design a long-term study to show uh, good results, they would have done it. Uh, yeah. And so the, I, I also kind of will tell people, well, I can make you lose weight in the short term, too, by chopping your leg off. You know, you'll lose weight. It's just not good for you. And I, That's I look a good at, analysis. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the thing with the keto diet is, yes, you do lose weight. And what happens is anytime somebody who's overweight who might have type 2 diabetes and some bad markers like cholesterol and mm -hmm. uh, triglycerides, when you lose weight, those markers are going to go down. Right. And so that's kind of the way I look at it. Yeah. Uh, but the long-term effects for me, I think, are uh, when you start to, to look at the, uh, the long-term effects of uh, oil exposure and fat exposure and cholesterol right. exposure, right. Uh, uh, that's... Uh, concerning for me. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, 
the the focus the I also look at animal based products as being uh, very nutritiously poor. Right. Uh, and no, pro inflammatory. Exactly. That's a, a good point. Yeah. Very pro inflammatory. Yep. So there's uh, no phytonutrients, no antioxidants. Very no fiber. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> no fiber. And so the I think there's there can be significant long term consequences. Definitely. And I think for me, what makes the keto diet so appealing to people is it does work for the short term, just like a plant based diet does. You have uh, there's some studies that have done head to head where you have the same amount of weight loss with keto and plant based, but it's not maintained long term with the keto, whereas the plant based it is. So um, I think that's going to be a big challenge with all these people that are initially successful. And then what do you do at that point in time? Well, I think that uh, most people are using it just as a, a, a weight loss fad, just like they do anything else. Sure. I don't think they plan on making it a lifestyle. As soon as they get to their target weight, yeah. fat to McDonald's? Yes. And, huh. and then, unfortunately, they're going to start yo-yoing again. Yeah, and so that's so true. For me, it's important to teach people how to have a good lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and a plant-based diet is a part of that. Definitely. Wow. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. And um, I, I think there have been some studies done talking about the low-carb craze as far as overall mortality and showing um, the low carb diet has a higher overall mortality, but it didn't really go into the ketogenic right. diet. You know, like are, are these people in ketosis? Probably not. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And I also have problems with uh, the whole concept. I've had people on, on a keto diet tell me, oh, we were meant, our brain was meant to run on ketones. And I, I was thinking, mm. well, you don't really understand, do you? They're probably just paying attention to the uh, you know, what's being said in the press. Right. Uh, you know, they don't understand the reality is that we, we, we started to stand upright and our brains grew bigger when we started eating carbohydrates. Right. Uh, and uh, they also don't truly understand what a paleo diet is. Mm, uh, mm -hmm. When you do a true analysis of what a paleo diet, it was, it was more like a, uh, a blue zones diet, you know, mostly. Right. Plants. Exactly. Uh, and so there's a, the whole concept of that was what the way our ancestors ate is not true. Right. I agree with that. I don't know if that'll have an impact on them if they learned, but uh, it is not true. You never know. Yeah. Sometimes for me in my fields, um, if I can get patients just to have one or two more servings of vegetables a day, that's a huge win for me, you know, absolutely. And, and it's a start. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we have to meet everybody where they are. Definitely. They, they don't, they're, they're not going to go from where they are, the standard American diet to what the way we practice overnight. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and we, and the studies have shown, by the way, you know this, that just incorporating one or two more servings does have a positive impact on health, longevity, yep. uh, chronic disease. And, and so that's just a great start. right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And another thing, when we talk about motivation and people that may not be ready to jump a hundred percent on board is to find a goal that is the smart goals, right? So actionable, reasonable, et cetera, achievable. and yeah. achievable. Yeah. Oh, was it actionable or achievable? I don't remember. Achievable, achievable. Yeah. and reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> to have a goal that is realistic, because I think a lot of people, especially with New Year's around the corner, say, oh, my gosh, my New Year's resolution. Actually, I did this last year. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> uh, side story, my New Year's resolution was to do 10 pull-ups in a row. And I'm like, I got this 10 pull-ups. It's December and I'm still not there. It's not an achievable goal, right? Start so with start with something that yeah. you can achieve. So maybe... Uh, one day a week, meat free, or you know, yeah. whatever it is. No, I, I agree, and I think that uh, uh, you know, I've had some recently. I was speaking to somebody, and they're trying to encourage their friend just mm. on January first go from your standard American diet to a complete yeah, plant based diet. That's and that's that's hard to do. It's doable, but it's tough. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, I, I mean, maybe if you you, you got to have the support there. You yeah. Got to do. I I kind of look at. I think there's three things I look at. Is uh, you got to have your why. Yes. Uh, and it's got to be a good, strong why that you can stick to. Yes. You've got to have support. Uh, and, and then you've got to arm yourself with information. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and that doesn't just happen overnight. You can't just say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to be do this. Yes. Uh, it takes True. some time to, to uh, you, the why hopefully is there. You can figure that out pretty quickly. It takes some time to get that support and get that information and, and put it in, put it into action. Right. Yeah. You could almost add in that information category, you need the how. Because I know well, that's, so that's many people I mean. that are like, oh, yeah, I know it's a healthy diet. You know, plant-based is the best way to go. But I, I don't know how. Right. I don't know where to start. Yeah. And know? I think that's probably a better way, better word rather than say information is the how. Yeah. Because I, I teach people the, the science behind things a lot in my talks. But then they, they want to know, well, well, how do I do it? Right. Uh, and that's when I refer them to Maya and tell her, tell them, you know, she'll teach you how to clean your pantry and cool. how to shop and how to cook. Uh -huh. You know, all those things that. That's all super uh, important. That are very important. 
Right, right. And the support, like you're saying. And I would even add not only family support, but support group, yeah. some sort of structure with people that are going through the same thing that you're doing, the same changes um, can be really beneficial. Absolutely. You know, like here in Hawaii, you guys have an amazing vegetarian society, which is out mm -hmm. there for the for the community. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we're doing in Dallas with plant based DFW is we're trying to yeah. create that community so people can be a part of something and go to it regularly and make friends. And absolutely and, uh, even, you know, even if they don't necessarily have that family support, as you and I have seen, yes, families don't always support our patients in what what we're trying to help them achieve. Right. And so they've got to have other sources of support. And then there's online resources. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook has dozens and dozens for of, sure. Uh, Facebook and support pages. groups. Yeah. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite of those pages is vegan in Costco. <laughs> and they oh, really? have yeah, like all of the, of. these, you know, the best things you can get there at current times. So that's yeah. kind of fun. So Maya and I were just saying, we've got to join Costco because we, uh, uh, got to take advantage of that Kirkland brand. Oh is yeah. That, is that an ad for Costco? I don't know. They're not sponsoring this video. <laughs> um, but Kirkland, I, I think they are, they're getting on board with, um, not only plant-based, but organic. They mm -hmm. have so many organic things and. For us here in Hawaii, it's probably the best priced groceries we can find. Yeah. So we were talking about the Vegetarian Society and how it's a, a good support mechanism. I love the Vegetarian Society. I'm one of their board members, so I'm a big proponent. But I do feel that when we're in these lectures, a lot of times we're preaching to the choir. Right. Everybody there is already on board. Right. So who are we making our case to? And that to me is rough. Like I need to figure out a way that we can um, speak to the masses, so yeah. to speak, and get the word out to people that may not want to go into a meeting like that or may not be on board with that. So there's got to be some sort of online. Right. And it's interesting you should point that out. I mean, I say that all the time. Mm -hmm. Many times I get invited to talk to a vegan group or a plant-based group. And I, yeah, I already, I use, I even use that term. I say, Hey guys, I'm preaching to the choir. Yeah. Uh, I'll start by asking how many of you here are vegan or plant-based. Yes. Just to kind of get a sense. Give of an audience. idea. Yeah. Um, and so it really pl pleases me when uh, I'm get, I get to an audience that's not necessarily vegan or plant-based. Right. Uh, recently I spoke at uh, the University of North Texas and we were invited by the vegan society to speak there. Uh, but as it turned out, 85% of the crowd was uh, not vegan. And uh, so, but what I found is that they were intrigued. Yes. Uh, they had not heard this information before. Uh, the questions, we I mean, we literally had to stop the questions because yeah. they, they kept asking yeah. questions until we were out of time. And then we took it outside and there was a line of people asking. So once, when we can get this message to other people, there is interest. Yes. Because people want to be healthy. Right. And many of them have not heard this before. Right. And they go, why haven't I heard this before? So that's the venue we have to find. <laughs> right. We need exactly. to find places like that yeah. more. Um, I had a similar experience. So a couple of weeks ago, um, I have a good friend, Nico, who put on a game changer screening. Mm -hmm. And it was to a high school and their families and, you know, some community members. The majority of people there were not plant based. It was wonderful. It was so refreshing to be there and to have all these questions asked that I like, you know, well, for me, they're like the easy questions, right? Mm -hmm. When you go to the vegetarian society, they're nitpicking. What right. about this? And what yeah. about this? Asking and, about icosanoids and different things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And um, it, it's nice to be speaking to people who just really basically want some of that basic information and guidance and yeah. really making a difference there, I think. Yeah. Although I will tell you, occasionally I've gotten the question from somebody who was a naysayer or a non-believer who wanted to, uh, you know, kind of sure. argue. Sure. Yeah. But at the same time, that's a good opportunity to answer their question. Yeah. Uh, in front of the other people. Exactly. As long as you're prepared and have your evidence and to address you're good issue. to go. Well, and you say evidence. And the good thing is, I think what you and I practice is evidence based medicine. Agreed. Yeah. We're Agreed. not making this stuff up and it's not anecdotes. Mm -hmm. It's all based on good data and evidence. For sure. In fact, that's that's how I became plant based. Uh, it wasn't just that, you know, somebody told me about it. and I said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, I was a little bit uh, I was a little bit uh, skeptical. Oh. Uh, when I first heard the message by Esselstyn about How, reversing atherosclerosis. And your first exposure was when Maya took you to Whole Foods? Right. For, okay. Yes, and that's where you were first skeptical. Yeah. Uh, reverse atherosclerosis? What are you talking about? I've been this treating is a this bunch stuff of for funk. decades. <laughs> no one ever told me that. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I'm sure they would have told me that if, uh, because I'm a specialist. I went to school. I went to fellowship. Right. And uh, to hear this a couple of decades after I finished uh, my training, I was skeptical and uh, and, but, uh, the data, I went and researched it and the data is there. The studies are there. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so I, I, you know, I changed the way I do things. 
correct me if I'm wrong, but for me, when I found all that research, it was kind of like, you know, when a kid finds out Santa isn't real and you're oh. like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And the same was for this. Like I thought met surgery for sure was the end all be all. This is it. This is the best we have in modern medicine. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, but wait, there's this whole other world. Yeah. We kind of want to believe, I mean, the way we've yeah. been trained that we're doing the best thing for our patients possible. Absolutely. And Otherwise, I, why are we doing what we do? Right. And I still, I still think that we do something meaningful oh, for and sure. very valuable. There, and that's an take, important point is there is a role for surgery. Absolutely. I don't, from, I don't even want to take away from Western medicine in general. I think that the vast majority of doctors have good intentions. Mm -hmm. I think that we just have to uh, understand that we have to kind of change what we've been looking at change yes. our paradigm a little bit and understand that we need to try to start preventing disease mm -hmm. rather than treating disease after it occurs. Yes. Uh, but yes, you were talking about the whole, uh, oh no, Santa Claus isn't real thing. And I felt a little bit betrayed. Yes. Uh, and thinking to myself, well, why haven't my people taught me that? And I don't think though, I don't go back and say, oh, they were purposefully hiding it from me. No. They were subject to the same conditions, issues, social, cult uh, cultural, other things that they were teaching me what they believed. Right. Uh, and uh, it, it's just that this stuff hasn't gotten out there as much as it needs to be. And, I agree. and that's hopefully what we're trying to do. I agree. And on that same note, I don't know how you feel about this, but sometimes you'll see on social media or on YouTube or whatever it is, um, there'll be videos saying, you know, your doctors are trying to kill you and all this stuff. And I guess I take that personally. Right, right. <laughs> and I, of course, I know when I'm friends and I respect so many people in the medical profession and um, to have this misconception, like you had said, that we're all on purpose doing this or it's a conspiracy, that's absolutely not true. Yeah. Not and, at all. Or, you know, the, the, the I hear the concept oftentimes that doctors are in cahoots with the pill industry. Yes. And I, in a way they are, but not because they're getting kickbacks from pill industry, but because we've been conditioned to give everybody a pill. And the American uh, or public in the world has been conditioned to get a pill when they, they go pill to the doctor. So we are giving the patients what they want. And the pill industry is getting what they want, too. But also, you have to say there are pills that really save lives. Uh, penicillin or, you know, there's basic things that we have revolutionized. Revolutionized? <laughs> revolutionized medicine, yeah. you know. Um, so there is a role for them. But I right. think it is a slippery slope. And it's... Yeah, I think we've gone too far. Yeah. And I, well, yeah. You know, uh, the, you talk about the pills that have an effect on, you know, antibiotics. That was part of the acute care model of... Yes. Uh, Western medicine. Yep. The mopping up the mess. Yeah. And, that, and that's important. When somebody has an infection, you've got an antibiotic that can help. Correct. But, you know, now that we're talking about chronic diseases that are preventable, and all we're doing is managing those diseases, hypertension, diabetes, yep. uh, hypercholesterolemia, triglycerides, and we're throwing a pill at them when, when your diet can change those things in a matter of weeks. Exactly. And so that's where we need to change the, the mindset. Yeah. And even, you know, for the example of penicillin, um, preemptively working to build up your immune system with fruits and vegetables and all those fighting nutrients could make you less vulnerable to this infection that you could get down the road. I have no doubt about it. Yeah. Uh, you probably heard me the other day say, uh, I will, I, although I used to say that the blood vessels were the most important organ in the body. Now I'm going to go ahead and give up and say that the gut is. I agree with yeah, you. And, the gut uh, is the favorite. <laughs> you know, and so the gut is extremely important and yeah. feeding our bacteria mm -hmm. in the gut with appropriate foods and uh, the fiber they need to boost so many different things. The immune system being one of them. Yeah. Uh, it's probably the largest immune organ in the body. Absolutely. Uh, when you think about it, not the lymph node systems or, uh, you know, the, anything like that or the blood. Uh, and, uh, but it's also contributes to many other physiologic processes throughout the body. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think that we can, through a good diet, prevent getting sick and prevent many chronic illnesses. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And on that note, too, um, speaking of drugs and all of that stuff, but the supplement industry is huge to jump on board with the microbiome mm -hmm. and probiotics and all this stuff, when in reality, it appears that probiotics may not be as much where it's at compared to prebiotics. So mm -hmm. eating all the fiber and the rich vegetable foods and the grains and the legumes, that's way better. You know, it, interesting point, uh, because we have been aware of probiotics for quite some time yes there's a point where i was thinking looking trying to say well which one should i take which and you go yeah. and you, you try to research literature and i found out there is no literature to prove that probiotics are uh you know that there's any one probiotic to take that they, they just don't know too much they don't know enough about it yet 
And so there's no uh, proof that uh, this probiotic is better or that one's better. And, right. And for what situation? And yeah, there's so many different strains, you yeah. know, and then substrains of probiotics. It's hard. And that kind of I feeds into my, back to my, my overall concept in general is a well-rounded whole food plant-based diet mm -hmm. is the way to go because that's going to achieve the best possible gut microbiome for you. Yes, I agree. I agree. And other things like exposure, right? So your microbiome is hugely dependent on your exposure to microbes throughout your daily life and mm. all of that. Yeah. People who have pets apparently have better microbiomes just oh, because they're exposed to the yeah. different, I don't know, whatever your dog brings in, yeah. you know, you get in your body. Hmm. So that's kind of cool. Let's move to supplements if you don't mind, okay. since we were talking about it. Um, I have a couple, well, two that I really wanted to talk about. Um, the first one is B12, and it's pretty much a, a no-brainer. People need to take B12. Right. Um, I well, guess... And I might comment that probably people on a standard American diet should consider taking B12, too. Absolutely. There's more B12 deficiency in the, in the general American population than the, than the vegan population. I agree with that. And also people over the age of 50. So mm -hmm. we're seeing some research, you know, when you're over 50, less intrinsic factor, you can't metabolize B12 as well, so you need to take a supplement at that point in time. Right. So that one's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that I find super controversial and want to pick your brain on is omega-3s. Okay. Um, omega-3s are kind of this weird group. Mm -hmm. I do research on it, and there's so much for and against supplementing in particular. So just to back up, we know we can get omega-3s from foods, flaxseed, chia seed, walnuts, mm -hmm. that type of those thing. Are my big three, yeah. yeah, so those are the big ones where you can get omega-3 fatty acids. But um, is there any benefit to supplementing additionally is my major question, and for a few different reasons. Yeah. So it, to look at the whole picture, right, there's such a controversy, even in the plant-based doctor world, you know, yeah. so like um, Caldwell Esselstyn says, no, you don't need a supplement. Gregor says, yes. Mm -hmm. McDougall says no. Who else? Berman says yes. So <laughs> Clapper says no now. But just changed, yes. which is quite interesting. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts? So I'm, uh, again, uh, to, to, for full disclosure, I'm kind of a, uh, a well-balanced diet. You don't need supplements in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then just to take this a step back for our audience, um, so we're talking about omega-3 supplements. Typically, that's known as fish oil supplements in the, yes. in the general population. Yes. And, uh, and it's been a big fad or a big craze over the last, I don't know, five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, there's this, this whole supplement industry that developed telling people that you need to take your fish oil supplements uh, in order to have good cardiovascular health. That was Correct. the big thing. Yes. And that's where it impacted me. Almost every one of my patients came in, they were taking fish oil pills mm -hmm. prescribed by their primary care doctor. And yet I didn't know whether it truly uh, impacted cardiovascular health. Somehow there was this thing that gained traction and, and everybody was using it because there were some studies that showed it. But then when you go back and critically look at all of the studies that are out there pro, uh, for uh, and against it, there's not really any incontrovertible, conclusive proof that there's uh, positive, uh, health from taking fish oil supplements. Right. Uh, and in fact, I recall one study that, uh, that showed that looked at people who were eating, uh, fish and they determined that the fish oil supplements themselves did not confer any benefit, but eating the fish did. Hmm. Uh, and so they determined that it was something else in the fish that might be helping them. That's interesting. Uh, and I found that interesting, but in general, huh. I've come to the conclusion that, uh, uh, that there's no proof out there that you need to take fish oil supplementation, uh, uh, therefore omega-3 supplementation. Now, but, and I mean, we might want to separate the general American population from the, the whole food plant-based population too. Yes. And there's some reasons for that yeah. as well. Uh, because there's some thoughts that those of us who adhere to a whole food plant-based diet don't get enough om omega-3 uh, uh, and omega-6s in our diet. And therefore, we might be deficient. Right. And, and I'll uh, kind of speak to that. But uh, uh, the to, to take a step back to the uh, standard American diet, one of the reasons, in my opinion, that they all promote the supplementation of omega-3s is because we get too much omega-6 in the standard American diet. Mm -hmm. There's an ideal ratio, which 
at least our current belief is that that should be around three to one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who knows over time. Three to one, omega-6 to omega-3, just to be clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but our our standard American diet gets us so much omega-6 that the, uh, and so little omega-3 that the ratio can be as high as 10 to 1, 25 to 1. I've even heard 50 to 1 in some studies. That's huge. And that ratio is not ideal for our health. Right. And so then rather than telling people to, well, and what are the sources of omega-6s? It's uh, some of those fatty things. It's uh, animal foods. It's oils. Vegetable it's oils. Trans fats. Yep. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, vegetable oils. Mm-hmm. And so uh, instead of telling people you need to cut back on those things that are unhealthy for you, they'd rather just tell them to take an omega-3 supplement so that they raise their omega-3 to change that ratio back to yeah, normal level. Yeah, right. So uh, sorry to interrupt, but this is a really important point. Um, the omega-6 and omega-3 pathways, they are competing pathways. So if you look at, um, and I'll put a picture, I'll find one and put one up somewhere, <laughs> of the two pathways. So you have the omega-6 and the omega-3s, and the omega-6 is generally the unhealthy pathway. Mm-hmm. As it goes down, you create arachidonic acid, which is a pro-inflammatory molecule. Mm -hmm. On the opposite side, the omega-3s go down. So basically from ALA gets converted to EPA, DHA, and it's all good, um, supposedly, right? So that's the anti-inflammatory omega-3 pathway. But the thing is, is they compete. So if you're on a standard American diet and you have a ton of omega-6s and not a ton of omega-3s, the omega-6s are going to take priority. So you get more of a pro-inflammatory pathway. habitus exactly. condition that's a very good point and yeah and i and i just might add that i mean we need the omega-6 and the omega-3 mm-hmm. pathways and Definitely. we do need inflammation in our body from time to time mm-hmm. it's just the emo- appropriate uh, appropriately regulated amount of inflammation not something where we're feeding that pathway over and over again right uh, so i uh, you know that's that was one thing I, I i comment about the standard american diet instead of teaching people to eat a better diet uh, we're just telling them to take some supplements to change that ratio. So another thing I'd like to add, uh, kind of about the standard American diet and the diseases that are uh, that go along with it, are that there are certain things that affect the uh, omega three pathway, uh, and such things as uh, uh, saturated fats, trans fats, uh, the uh, chronic diseases like uh, diabetes. Okay. Uh, all those things also take away from the production of. Uh, and uh, deficiencies in vitamins and minerals, they all take away from the production of omega-3s as yes, well. Yes, and I think alcohol is another one that Absolutely. is in that pathway. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so that, now, now, now take this and go to a plant-based diet where the plant-based diet doesn't have all of that omega-6 right. uh, that you get from a traditional American uh, animal-based diet. So your ratios are more normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you also don't have the uh, vitamin deficiencies, uh, the chronic diseases. And, and uh, I think that people on a plant-based diet... Uh, typically have better ratios. Sure. Uh, and uh, so uh, now, so now, this is all getting to the point as to whether I recommend supplementation. And so I kind of, my, my belief is that a well-rounded whole food plant-based diet is going to achieve a, a good ratio. Uh, your your uh, omega-6s are going to be lower uh, and you're not going to have these other processes that are going on that are taking away from omega-3 pathway mm-hmm. production. So in my, my general belief is that uh, because there's not a lot in the literature to say that we need to have it. Right. Uh, therefore, I don't recommend supplementation. Uh, and we didn't even talk about brain health. That's where I was going to go yeah. next. Because yeah. I think for me, that's my, the only argument where I'm on the fence yeah. and kind of leaning towards supplementation is with the brain health. Yeah. And so from my standpoint, again, there's, there's no uh, definitive proof that it's po- uh, it helps with brain health. We, we, we look at cognition, mm-hmm. dementia, mm-hmm. brain size. Uh, and, uh, there's, there, there, there's no studies out there that you know, there, there, there's a lot of inconclusive studies. I think there's one study showing positive effects. There's one study showing negative effects. Yeah. When you take the body of work, it's not something that's all to once or mostly to one side of mm-hmm. the zero line. Right. You know, it's kind of just all smattered around. Zero. Right. And so for me, again, there's no conclusive proof. Now right. you might say then, well, if there's no harm, exactly. Can you go ahead and take mm-hmm. it? And that's where I used to be. Mm-hmm. Okay, because I uh, I think if you if there's something that you can take that uh, doesn't hurt you, then and you think there might right. be some benefit, then go What's ahead. What's the take harm? It. Yeah. Uh, now we're talking about a supplement uh, where it's not in its whole form. It's not yep. kind of in its whole food, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. again, I typically not a big fan of it because those aren't necessarily always as effective. Recently, uh, there's been some work done by a group in Seattle that showed uh, in uh, men who had high DHA levels, they were uh, 
more prone to uh, developing prostate cancer. Yeah, I saw that. So now we've got a study, not a lot, but a right. study that shows that there's a possible negative effect of having high DHA levels. Uh, so uh, in that particular case, DHA supplementation uh, could have a negative impact. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously in that situation, you're negating the positive impact of, right. of what... So I, uh, it's, I, I still think the jury's kind of out, is still out on all yeah. of this. And there's some, some things we can look at. For example, how do you supplement? Now, do you supplement uh, using walnuts, Flat, ground flax seed and uh, ground chia seeds, uh, and then you allow the body to take it through its natural pathway, mm -hmm. or do you supplement with algae-based DHA, right. which then goes straight to the bottom line? Yes. Now, so the way I look at it is, if you're going to want to try to supplement, supplement the more natural way. Uh, increase your intake of mm -hmm. ground flax seed, ground chia, ground chia be being the highest source, uh, or walnuts, mm. and allow your body, if it needs it, to take it down that pathway and produce the DHA. Right. Uh, at least you're giving your body the raw ingredients to right. for that pathway. Whereas if you just go to the bottom line and give them that DHA, uh, then are you contributing to something that your body may not have needed in the first place mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and causing other problems? Now, I will say that that study was in men who had high DHA levels. Okay, so, so not normal DHA. Not normal DHA levels. Right. So if you're going to supplement with DHA, then do you go and have your DHA level checked every so right. often. Right, uh, that's a good so, point. So that you can just make sure you're in the normal range. Yeah, and the other important point too is almost all of the studies we have on omega-3 supplementation are done with fish oil supplements. What about the algae-based supplements? Right. Is You know, are, are they cleaner, so to speak? We don't know, we don't have enough data on that. Um, and then the other big question and counter argument, I guess I would bring in is, how well do we metabolize the um, the ALA into mm -hmm. DHA and EPA? Right. And I know for a fact there's some genetic polymorphisms where some people, and it's fairly common, don't metabolize ALA into those other essential acids mm -hmm. um, as efficiently as others. Right. So that's a concern. Yeah, and I think there's some thought in general that vegans and people who are on whole food plant-based mm -hmm. diets don't uh, convert as well. Mm. Uh, and, but at the same time, the studies have not shown any deficiencies in that population of people. Mm. That, uh, so there's been some thought that maybe we're more efficient at converting what we do. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so in other words, uh, we just, we, if it's available to us, we convert what we need and make what we need. Right. Um, and or is it just that we don't necessarily need as high a level because we're on a different diet? Maybe we aren't, we don't have all that omega-6 Therefore, mm -hmm. we don't need as much. Uh, That's right. Uh, omega three pathway. Right. Are the requirements based on somebody on the standard American diet? Yes. Good question. So I, I won't. I won't say that there, we have an answer. What I would just say right now is I would err on the side of not necessarily taking that supplement, mm. or if you want to supplement your diet, do it through the natural food process. Pathways. Sure. Whole foods. Yeah. So that's where I am right now. Yeah. Now, now talk to me in a year or two when if maybe there's some more studies and we'll For see sure. if, I, if I've changed. For sure. Um, I, on that note, I do think that there is a new study should be out in 2020 where they're looking at, again, omega-3 supplementation and heart health, but with different doses compared to the huge meta-analysis that was done a while back. But right. we'll stay tuned for that. It is. It's pretty confusing. It is. It's very yeah. confusing. There's just so much out there. And there's. Uh, I, I, it's amazing to me, though, that there's no conclusive data, mm -hmm. yet it's become a, a billion-dollar industry. That's right. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that I, I just learned this recently um, and I was surprised was Dean Ornish with his reversing heart disease studies with his protocol. He actually gave a fish oil supplement. Huh. So that was yes. part of the thing. And I, yes. I didn't realize that till I really looked into his studies and I yeah. was like, wow. That's... And, I, and I was aware of that because I thought, said to myself, oh, well, you know, then it's not 100 percent plant based. Yeah. Because uh -huh. it's a fish oil supplement. Yep. Well, and maybe if he had had uh, the algae based, based yep. at the time, it would have been different. Definitely, you know? definitely. Um, and then on the topic of being confusing, I agree. I think any general person, when they see us having this discussion or, you know, whether it's about keto versus whole food or whatever it happens to be and everything's so confusing and we're in the weeds, a lot of people will say, oh, forget it. I, I'm just going to stick to my standard American diet. I'm not going to change yeah. anything because clearly nobody knows what's the best option. Right. Well, and my answer for that is is that uh, don't get caught up in all the stuff that we're talking about. Yeah. 
you know, um, we're kind of taking, you know, as, as physicians and people who treat, we're kind of taking it to uh, an extreme, yeah. which I don't want most people to worry about. Right. Uh, what I tell people is eat more fruits and vegetables, mm-hmm. eat less processed foods, eat less meat, dairy, yeah. and cheese. Uh, yeah. And you're going to be healthier for mm-hmm. it. And don't get caught up in the nitty gritty. Don't yeah. even try to worry about how much protein you're getting and how many mm-hmm. carbs you're getting and how much mm-hmm. fat you're getting. Yep. Uh, and so therefore, it's not as difficult as you think. Right. And back, that goes to show your point, a whole food plant-based diet, you should get the nutrients you need as long as it's a balanced whole food diet. Um, you should get everything you need. And that's my belief. Yeah. And so you don't need to be a scientist uh, to do it. Yeah. Uh, and you and I enjoy doing this because we do want to know uh, the science behind mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And, and what it is that we are recommending to our patients. And if we have to sometimes make tweaks on certain situations, how to how to do that. That's right. But they don't have to worry about that. They don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Uh, one last question, because I haven't done this yet. I don't know if you have, but um, have you looked at um, how much, say, of ground chia seeds you would have to eat a day just to meet the requirements for so omega-3? So I... I think it's two tablespoons. Oh, that's uh, it. It's a small amount. Oh, okay. And you get 4.5 grams or so of uh, 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 DHA, which is exceeds the, 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 the recommended amount for uh, a male adult is like 1.6. And for of male, omega-3s, uh, yeah. Of a female is 1.1. Grams. 1. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you get way more than you need. Okay. That's more than salmon, by the way. That's wow. more than 100 gram serving uh-huh. of salmon. Okay. Uh, so... Ground chia seeds are an easy way to do it. Very and good. Uh, you can do, uh, like I said, uh, ground flax seeds, walnuts. Yeah, right. All of those get you the uh, the recommended daily amount. Do the chia seeds, do they have to be ground? Or can you do like a chia pudding and they're just like... I think they have to. They should they be, have ground. be ground. Yeah. Uh, because with the chia pudding, if you don't chew up all those things... They then might it's just insoluble, digestion. like yes. flax. Yes. Same idea. Okay. That At makes sense. that's my feeling, yeah. Okay. So, Riz, where can my audience find you? I know you and Maya are very active on social media. Where can they find you? So, I uh, we have a lot of things going on, but what I tell people is to go to www.plantbaseddfw.com, and that DFW stands for Dallas Fort Worth. Uh, and from that site, uh, it has links to all of our stuff. We're a member of Plant Pure uh, Communities. Okay. A member of Walk with the Doc, uh, and it has links to those things. Uh, it has our uh, monthly events where we have anywhere from a couple of events to four events, uh, which might be speaking engagements, potlucks, walking nice. events. Um, and then, uh, you know, it also has links to our Instagram pages. Maya has one. I have one. We have a Facebook page. We have a YouTube channel and we have a podcast like you guys. So, uh, uh, well, or this yours is all YouTube. We don't have a yeah, podcast. I'm YouTube. like, <gasps> right. So uh, <laughs> another project. I don't know. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, and so we also have a, a, a podcast, which cool. we, uh, uh, we enjoy doing. That's so it awesome. Has link, uh, rather than giving you all of those separate Just, links, go to our website uh, and that's where you can find everything. Very good. Well, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your knowledge and your stories. And it's been wonderful chatting. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. I, I, I imagine we could talk for a lot longer. Oh, we totally could. Uh, and, you know, we come back to Maui uh, regularly, so maybe we can uh, yeah. make, a, make a habit of this. We'll have you back for a third appearance oh, awesome. in no time. Awesome. <laughs> Good. Right. Thank you. Sure. Well, that's a wrap. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys learned something valuable and applicable to your individual health journey. If you like this video, please go check out Riz and Maya's page. Uh, Please give us a thumbs up if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't already. And finally, just let us know what topics you want to learn more about in the comments below. Thanks for watching, everybody. Until next time. Aloha. Oh, wait a minute. Aloha. Oh. Did I do it right? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) It's a a wrap. wrap. (laughs) (laughs) That's the one we used to do.